You are about to enter the world of urban legends, where fact is often stranger than fiction. Sometimes it's hard to tell the difference between truth and urban legend. You found yourself in the land of urban legends. Here, you will see three tales that will test your ability to discern the truth. Two of the stories are complete myths, but one is true. Will you be able to tell the difference? First, sharp pencils and teenage angst lead to a fatal and horrifying act of desperation. Then, a medical emergency. A woman is literally turned inside out by a high-powered vacuum toilet. And a stag night turns deadly. It's a show that literally takes the groom's breath away. Three bizarre tales to be sure, but make no mistake, one actually happened. It's up to you to figure out which one. We'll tell you if you're right at the end of the show. First up, can sharp pencils kill? For many teenagers at Catherine Gable School in Portland, Oregon, high school was the best days of their lives. But not all students felt that way. Alex Forbes' school days were filled with academic highs, but no one knew about his emotional lows. Not even his mother, Karen Forbes. He had a straight A record, um, always did. Um, ever since, ever since he was in kindergarten, really. You know, we never tried to push him or anything like that. He just, just this innate ability to do really well at school. Only now is she able to talk openly. Karen Forbes continues to struggle to make sense of the tragedy surrounding her gifted son. Her family life was left shattered, her marriage broken. She's been treated for depression and undergoes weekly therapy. It seems nothing will fill the void left by her son, but Karen's loss is also shared by her older son. He lives with his father in a different city, but they both decline to be interviewed. Alex touched the lives of many in his brief life. Meet Alex's classmate, Melanie McGuinness. She too was keenly aware of Alex's academic ability, but unaware of his emotional problems. You know, he was a science whiz. He could do everything, you know, chemistry, biology, physics, and he'd finish all his homework and, you know, projects in half the time as everyone else did. And then he'd sit there and help me with mine. Alex? I don't understand the mechanism of philotropism. Alex was falling madly in love with Melanie, but she doesn't realize it. Alex is so shy, he can't tell her how he feels. You know, we were kind of close. But not close enough for Alex. Unable to attract Melanie with anything more than his mind, Alex is frustrated and forlorn, and it becomes more and more difficult for him to hide his emotions. In the days leading up to an exam, he's unable to focus, and for someone so bright, he is strangely concerned about the big test. Before that particular exam, he spent hours, hours and hours alone in his room. You know, I asked him if he was worried about that particular test or anything, and, and he was just like, oh, I, I just want to do really well on it. And I was like, great, OK. The day of the test arrives. Those close to Alex are about to witness just how troubled he is. Meet exam monitor Dave Edlins. I'll never forget that day. This is a very important exam. I oversaw the, uh, the test.
The exam is supposed to last three hours. The test itself should have posed no challenge to Alex. He'd routinely finished exams early. His classmates soon learned that something was up with Alex. I was sitting there sharpening all these pencils. There was shavings, you know, all over his desk and all over the floor, and, and they were everywhere. Alex's fixation with Melanie and pencil sharpening catches the attention of others in the class. Some were looking over at him because of the noise he was making with the pencils. And I, I noticed he was looking at uh, the McGinnis girl. I was sitting across from him, and then he just had these two pencils. They looked pretty sharp. What happened next was, it was like, I don't know, it's like some out of a movie or something. I walked toward him. He just took the two pencils and put them up his nose. And I giggled a little, because it looked funny, you know? There was this horrible thudding noise. It was horrible. It was just really horrible. Screaming, and uh, everybody was in chaos. The pencils had been driven into Alex's brain. He died instantly. On the back of his exam paper, a chilling suicide note. I mean, I just read the note that he wrote over and over and over again. Achieving excellence is easy for me, but I can never achieve the excellence of love. They gave all the kids in that, in that class who saw Alex do that, they, they gave them all a, like a 4.0 high grade, regardless of how they did. There is a bittersweet irony to Alex's story. Things could have turned out differently. I, I did kind of like him. I was attracted to him, but it's just, it's not something I would have told my friends because, you know, he wasn't that cool. But, you know, if he had maybe tried to kiss me or something while we were studying, I probably would have let him. This classroom drama is a sad tale with a shocking end. But is it true? Can someone kill themselves by jamming a pencil through their nose and into the brain? Give it some thought, and we'll reveal all at the end of the show. Meanwhile, try to guess correctly on this mini-myth. Mini-myth number 85, an airbag annihilation. Staff at the Royal Free Hospital in Reading, England, was perplexed over the cause of death of one admission. The paperwork said road traffic accident, but the body said plastic religious statue plunged through the heart. Police reports confirmed the driver was a devout Christian. She had grabbed the model of Jesus off her dashboard just before she crashed. The impact of the expanding airbag drove the holy statue into her chest, killing her. True tale or just a mini-myth? Actually, it's just a load of hot air. It's been going around since airbags were invented. On Urban Legends, we'll present three stories for your consideration. You have to decide which one is true. Is it the story of how love and a sharp pencil drove a distraught teenager to take his own life? Or could it be our second story, Inside Out? A woman has a horrifying experience while sitting on a toilet. The cruise ship, an international symbol of elegance the transport of choice for those who want complete luxury and style. And yet, the sea has been the center of some dreadful disasters. 
Meet holiday travelers Dr. Brendan Wynn and his wife Patricia. The Wynn's happy ocean voyage is drawing to a close when they become involved in a bizarre incident. Lurking on board is an accident waiting to happen. Passengers, including Mrs. Wynn, had noticed something unusual about the bathrooms. We sort of uh, commented on the sound that the toilets made when you flushed them. This was not a normal sound. This was a very loud mechanical vroom when the toilets were flushed. The good ship Pegasus was built in 1972 and had all the latest conveniences, including a state-of-the-art industrial sewage suction pump. This meant the onboard toilets operated with the use of a very powerful vacuum, and they worked well until one fateful evening in 1986 while docked in Vancouver, Canada. An announcement came over the loudspeaker that said, would the skipper please come to the front desk for an emergency, and if there's a doctor on board, could the doctor please come to the front desk for an emergency? Dr. Wynn is summoned along with his wife, who's a qualified nurse. They are taken to the cabin of Mrs. Helen Larson, where they see something neither of them was quite prepared for. You'll be all right. You will. Thank you. Seems to be a problem here. <gasps> this woman, uh, about age 70 or so, was lying on her bunk on her side. At least. 10, 12 feet of uh, small intestine was lying in the bed behind her. She was going into shock, and because of her critical condition, we wanted to get her to a hospital as quickly as possible. Mrs. Larson's intestines are still attached to her body, but entirely outside her abdomen. Stunned though they are, the winds immediately move to stabilize the patient. Her husband didn't say too much except that she was on the toilet when this happened. She had gone into the bathroom. This was a very small cabin, and she had a bowel movement. Mrs. Larson's thighs create an airtight seal around the toilet bowl. While sitting down, she flushes, and the vacuum power sucks out her small intestines. Luckily for Mrs. Larson, the ship is in port. She's rushed to the nearest hospital where surgeons successfully put her bowel back in place. It's an amazing, gut-wrenching story that makes you queasy just thinking about it. But is it true? We'll satisfy your curiosity at the end of the show. Just when you thought it couldn't get any weirder, take a look at this mini-myth. Mini myth number 245, the molasses disaster. On January 15, 1919, in the North End neighborhood of Boston, Massachusetts, a tank containing 2.3 million gallons of molasses bursts open. A 15-foot wave of the sticky liquid pours through the streets at about 35 miles per hour. It kills 21 and injures 150 others. Is it to be believed? Yes, it's true. The Boston Molasses disaster of 1919 is a well-documented historical fact. It was caused by a combination of unseasonably warm weather and a faulty tank. The sticky mess took six months to clean up. Locals claim they can still smell the molasses today. So far, we've told you about the teen whose unrequited love led him to take his own life with pencils. And the tale of the toilet, its flush powerful enough to pull a poor, unsuspecting woman's insides out. Were they true? Don't guess until you've seen our third and final story, the groom who should have stayed home on his stag night. This derelict building used to be a strip club, but it closed after a bizarre incident and has never reopened. 
That incident happened on June 23rd, 2000, during a party for groom-to-be, Danny Redmond. Meet Karen Richardson. Danny had proposed to her on a holiday. He got down on one knee, did it all traditional. It was really romantic. But before the ceremony, Danny's best man organizes a stag party that is going to be a night to remember. Meet David Hampson. Well, we've got a big group of the lads together. Meet up on Broad Street at six. Go for a load of lagers. Then a massive curry. Then some more lagers. Then pile into a lap dancing club. I did have some reservations about it, to be honest, but I trusted David not to go overboard, and I trusted Danny, you know. I didn't think he'd do anything stupid. Stupidity may have played a part, but one exotic dancer has a huge role in the tragic event. Her name is Laura Jones, AKA Roxana. She declined to be interviewed for the program, but a fellow dancer and eyewitness to the event agreed to speak. Meet Lisa Marie Billington. There was me um, and Ali, who danced as divine. Michelle, who was Destiny, and Laura, who was Roxana. She just had the biggest implants I'd ever seen. Dressed as a bride for the stag, the amply endowed Roxana turns her attention to the groom-to-be. It was always mental. She comes in, like, wearing, because it was a stag do, she dresses up as, like, a dirty bride. She said, oh, as it's your special day, I'll give you a treat. So she takes these handcuffs that she had from when she dressed up as a policewoman, and she um, cuffs his hands behind the chair. She cuffed his hands to the back of the seat and starts, like, grinding on him. Danny's intoxicated and ready to play along. Roxana proceeds to step up the action to the delight of the onlookers. You know, really going for it, like rubbing her boobs in his face. Danny begins gasping for breath. We were just kind of standing back, like, just, you know, having, having you know, smiling at it all. He looked like he was loving it. Roxana playfully deprives Danny of air, what she mistakenly thinks to be a pleasurable sexual experience known as erotic asphyxiation. But Roxana doesn't know how dangerous this aspect of sex play can be, especially when you don't know what you're doing. Here to explain is expert and columnist, Dr. Catherine Hood. The theory behind asphyxiation for sexual pleasure is that depriving the brain of oxygen um, makes a person feel faint and heightens their sensations. So a lot of people find that pleasurable. But it's also thought it might release endorphins from the brain, which are your body's natural feel-good chemicals. Danny isn't experiencing any pleasure at this point. The handcuffs, alcohol, and asphyxiation puts his life in mortal danger. You know, he, he, went, he went a bit still and uh, Roxana got off him. She was, she, she realized first, I think. She just started shaking him. It was terrible. He just went limp. He was unconscious, except he wasn't unconscious. He was dead. Daddy, Daddy, mate, Daddy, mate, go. Well, she must have smothered him. He must have suffocated. Just couldn't believe it. None of us could believe it. It's estimated that there are as many as 300 deaths a year due to um, asphyxiation gone wrong. If, if you've taken a lot of alcohol, then that acts as a natural depressant for the brain anyway. So obviously, it, it's not only going to impair your reflexes and your ability to signal for help, but it actually might exacerbate the effects of, of blocking off oxygen to the brain. He had his hands handcuffed behind his back, which is pretty impossible to give any kind of hand gesture or any kind of signal to say, look, enough. Yeah, I miss Danny. He was my best mate. I, I do kind of 
blame him because he took him there, but I know that's not fair. I mean, yeah, we used to do everything together. Oh, he's gone. Gone, but not forgotten. Could Danny have suffocated as a result of Roxana's careless sex play? Do people really die from what is known as erotic asphyxiation? We'll tell you the truth after this mini-myth. Mini-myth number 10, the parachute plunge. Ivan McGuire, an experienced parachutist from North Carolina, had over 800 jumps under his belt. He was planning to videotape a private lesson given by an instructor when he made a big mistake. He'd packed his video equipment on his back instead of his parachute, and when he tried to pull the ripcord, there wasn't one there. Oops. So what about that tall story? Did you fall for it? Good, because it's true. Ivan McGuire jumped to his death in 1988, back in the days when video equipment really did weigh as much as a parachute. It's time to tell you which one of her three stories is true. Is it the lovesick teenager, dead as a result of sharp pencils piercing his brain? Well, we all know that putting anything up your nose is dangerous, but in this case, the story is completely false. It never happened, but it is a well-worn urban legend, the result of a very dark imagination. People have tried it before, but despite being extremely dangerous, no one has ever died. But please don't try it. Is it the story of the stripper who suffocated the bridegroom? No, this story is false. It was first reported in January 2002 in the tabloid press, and it spread quickly. While there are cases of death caused by erotic asphyxiation, this wasn't one of them. According to studies by the Federal Bureau of Investigation, between 250 and 1,000 deaths can be attributed to this rough sex play in the United States each year. As well, most strip clubs don't allow patrons up on stage, and there has never been a documented case of death attributed to suffocation in this way. So that leaves us with the incredible story of the woman who flushed while sitting on a toilet and had a portion of her small intestine pulled from her body. Yes, it's completely true. The Pegasus was a real ship with a powerful vacuum pump toilet system that in 1986 did the damage. Mrs. Larson really was a passenger on that ship who survived the incident. Dr. Wynn really is a doctor who initially attended to Mrs. Larson. It was a strange sight, a sight I had never seen before. To this day, the winds are wary of strange toilets. And on a boat or on an airplane, um, I do stand up. That's all we have for you this time. Did you guess the real story? Well, if not, we'll give you another chance to test your truth-seeking ability on the next Urban Legends. <laughs>